very pleased on behalf of Brown Residential College and the Virginia Festival for the Book to welcome you today to talk with Forrest Pritchard, author, farmer, and author of Gaining Ground, which is here, also I'll mention. Um, Forrest is going to share his work with us, and then we're going to open it up to you to share your questions or your thoughts. Following the talk, um, books will be on sale and available for signature, and we're going to have some refreshments in the back, and we hope you'll know about and chat with, us, chat with us some more. Um, before leaving, I'd like to ask you to please fill out a comment form that you were given when you came in. If you want to just leave that on your seat, I'll pick it up. Helps the festival keep keep its high quality. Also want to, on behalf of the festival, encourage you to think about giving back to the festival. Um, it's free for us to attend, but it's not free for them to put on. So consider giving back to the festival if you can. Please join me in welcoming Forrest Richard. I went to another state school right down the road, College of William & Mary, and uh, graduated in 1996. And according to the uh, paragraph out front, which uh, coincided in 1996 was when the Brown uh, Sustainable uh, Series began. So as, as I was kind of beginning my farming story, I've been farming since 1996, uh, almost 20 years now. Um, you guys were beginning your journey as well, so I think that's kind of a nice serendipity uh, to intersect here with. Thank you guys for having me. The hospitality has been great. My farm is uh, about two and a half hours up the road, uh, right outside of Berryville, Virginia. I'm a full-time farmer. Um, if you'd like to know how an English geology kid goes from William Mary and becomes a full-time farmer, that's kind of what the book is about. Um, when I got out of college in 1996, um, the farm had been in my family for six generations. And in 1996, it was very evident that the age of strip malls and, and subdivisions and all these things had come to our little corner of Clark County, Virginia, uh, just across the Blue Ridge from Loudoun County, uh, Leesburg and, and Tyson's Corner and all those places. So I felt a very strong sense of stewardship uh, wanting to come back and, and trying to figure out a way to take our place and make it sustainable from an economic standpoint. Both of my folks had off-farm jobs. Uh, my dad worked in the city. My mom. Uh, worked a job in town, and uh, something approaching 100% of their income annually went into keeping taxes paid, the farm bills paid, roofs on the barns, things like that. <clears throat> so I said, look, I'm 21, 22 years old. Uh, I can, you know, I've, I've read the, the American stories of success. You know, you, you, you work hard and and you get up early and, and you go to bed early and healthy, wealthy, and wise, et cetera, et cetera, and, and you just make this happen. So that first year, I also didn't want to be incredibly naive, um, so I collaborated with fellow farmers in the area and uh, listened to what other uh, universities, such as Virginia Tech and, and West Virginia and Penn State, our area land-grant institutions, told us that farming should be done in this area. You take fields and you put herbicide and pesticide and, and fertilizer on them, and you plant corn and soybeans, and you make a profit. Sound good? So far, so good, right? It's the story of American agriculture uh, to this day. So my first year, I did that, and uh, went at it very wholeheartedly, and, and uh, collaborated with an experienced farmer. And our first year, which is where the, the first chapter of the book picks up, uh, our profit was $18.16. Our, you know, and anybody can, you know, I go to different parts of the country, and I tell that story, and when I tell that in Iowa, I inevitably there's an old grizzled farmer that will raise his hand and say, well, you're lucky that you made a profit at all. <laughs> well, that's true. That's, that's kind of like being lucky for getting your, your hand caught in a bear trap instead of your whole arm. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's that kind of luck we can all live without. Anyway, our story is one of tremendous optimism and hope. Uh, growing hope, uh, not just uh, physically growing stuff, but uh, you know, a growing movement of hope in agriculture, and our farm is very much a part of that. We run 500 acres of pasture. So from herbicide, pesticide, commercial fertilizers, grain harvested by, uh, by combines and, and shipped away uh, to be fed in feedlots, um, we are now a 500 acre grass farm. We raise diversified livestock, 100% finished grass, uh, grass fed and finished cattle and sheep. And then we raise uh, free-range chickens, uh, turkeys, and pigs, all on pasture, all free-range, 
all outdoors. If you don't believe me, come visit my farm anytime, please. That's what we do. I do farmer's markets for a living. 97% of the food I raise goes straight to farmer's markets where I hand over a dozen eggs, a pound of ground beef to people at farmer's market each morning. Tomorrow morning I'll be at Arlington Courthouse. I imagine some folks are from the Northern Virginia area around here. Uh, the remaining uh, three, four uh, percent, we've got an on-farm store, a few restaurants, but mostly I do farmer's markets. I'm that guy who it's impossible, you know, to get any of this stuff done. Well, our farm does it, and I've got peer, peers that do it as well. I'm going to show you a little bit about why all that stuff works out for us. But in the meantime, I know that you guys have a basketball game tonight. <laughs> and uh, I heard you're number one seed. Congratulations. Wait. William Mary is uh, busily, studling, stu busily studying something <laughs> right now instead of enjoying basketball. Uh, and I wanted to just throw you guys some red meat, uh, get it out of your system. Uh, yes, you're playing basketball, but I also wanted to put a farming touch on it. So what I did was I uh, replaced some heads with livestock. <laughs> and just I put some chickens on the court just to kind of uh, influence my, 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 uh, my flavor. Um, so in a town like Charlottesville, where I met, I know you guys have a very successful farmer's market, um, and you've got farm-to-table restaurants, and, uh, and CSAs, and all these wonderful things, um, that's great. It's really penetrated in a town like Charlottesville, and Virginia is wonderful in so much that it's a great place to grow food. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to grow food. Steve was just telling me he's got a family farm just down the road in Ivy, and gets there every chance that he can get. Um, and yet, for like the rest of the country, you know, so much of our country is, uh, you know, we've tipped, we've tipped the, the scales and we're more urban now than we are rural for the first time in our cultural history. So what is it about family farms in particular that's, that's, reson that's resonating so much with us? And Kate and I were talking about earlier, kind of like this desire, this human desire to be kind of nostalgic. Is it just nostalgia? Is it just, you know, is it just that? Or is there some deeper deeper thing that we, that we need. Uh, so this is our farm. This is in Clark County, Virginia. That's the Blue Ridge, Shenandoah River. John Denver wrote a little song about this neck of the woods uh, called Country Roads. And uh, uh, DC is about 50 miles right over the Blue Ridge there. So we are a grass farm. This picture was taken like uh, last May, something like that, after we've kind of greened up a little bit. And so we say, you know, as a farmer, I'm in the 1% bracket of people that actually grow food. You know, hopefully everybody here is eating, eating well. Hopefully everybody everywhere is eating and eating well. Uh, but as a farmer, I'm in that real rare little, little pie segment. So as I'm direct marketing your food, I have to constantly ask what's in it for everybody else, okay? Because the way most of our food works is a farmer grows food and you put it on a truck and you send it down the road and you get a check in the mail, okay? And since I'm at Brown, I tweak this just a little bit last night and thinking there might be some future farmers in the crowd. And as a farmer, uh, these are questions that I ask myself. Um, I ask questions about, like, why would customers buy and why, why do I continue to do it? The kind of farming I do is risky. It's weather dependent. It's seasonal. It's, it's grueling. I work uh, uh, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I'll be up, up at farmer's market at 4 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. It's capital intensive. I, was, I had lunch with a couple students for Brown today. And uh, he's, uh, a kid said, uh, you know, I want to be a farmer in a couple years, but, you know, I've got to figure out a way how to buy the farm. Uh, well, all, all land around here isn't priced for farming. It's priced for, to have a house on it. Okay, it's great farmland, but that's not how it's priced. And I gave him advice. I say, be patient, lease, uh, uh, you know, do a rent for a while and build your experience. And last but not least, the kind of farming that I do is genuinely slow. Uh, a lot of folks have heard about slow food. Well, it's called slow food on both ends. It's, it's slow cooking and slow preparation, but the kind of food I grow is, is nutrient and mineral dense, uh, but it takes me two years to raise a grass-fed beef on pasture, where it takes a, about 18 months in confinement. Okay? Nobody wants to wait two years for a hamburger. I, I sure don't. So what's the deal with family farms? Uh, this is driving down uh, rural Route 608, right in front of my farm, a little glimpse of some of our livestock. To give you a quick sense of numbers, we raise about 200 head of cattle, 300 lambs each year, about 300 hogs, and many, many thousands of, of free-range chickens. And we'll see some pictures of that as we go along. So what's the deal with somebody driving along the road where I'm coming back from farmer's market, and I'm a little sleepy and groggy, 
and I almost rear end somebody on the turn because they pulled the car over and are taking pictures of our farm. Um, I think it's beautiful versus the, the feedlot uh, where way over uh, not, you know, 98, 99% of our beef comes from. Where the only little bit of greenery is down in the foreground, uh, which is about six foot high, just perfectly suited. So when you drive by, you can't see it, right? We don't see these places, we smell them uh, when we're driving on the highway. We're listening to Led Zeppelin or, or whatever we're doing, and that smell comes sucked in. And we hope it'll go away as soon as possible. Well, that's where those smells come from. We were talking earlier about things kind of being out of balance. We'll talk more about that in a second. We're constantly told that these are, this is food we can trust, okay? Uh, it's put in our face, uh, it's written into the logos, it's authentic, it's superior. I think it's particularly emblematic that white bread is right in front of all that. And as a farmer, I go into these places, I see these things out in front of my supermarket, and we're told that they're insane, as though that's a good thing, okay? That the prices are so low, it's insane. How could they possibly be, possibly be advertising these prices. As a farmer who got 18 bucks for a year's worth of work, I say, yes, uh, clown mascot of Weird Al Yankovic. Um, <laughs> these, prices, these prices are insane. That's copyright infringement <laughs> right there. They should be ashamed of themselves. So this is my local food lion, Martin's kind of place, right? Where I can assure you, other than knowing uh, that most of this stuff came out of corn and wheat and, uh, and soybean, uh, again, which is uh, 100 million acres of what we grow uh, when we think about farming in this country. Other than base knowing that, I don't know anything else about this food. Uh, no farmers who grew this know that this is like uh, any of their food or, or where their food came from. Um, and this isn't the kind of farming that we kind of broke out of uh, successfully. So just to be neat and Hollywood about it, I'm going to suggest that why we value family farms so much is for these three things, transparency, trust, and the last one is truth, which I put in italics. That's a risky one. Okay, I'm the one standing up here saying that. And I put that in italics, and we, uh, I'll, I'll revisit that because everybody has their own version of truth, and we'll see if we can agree on what that is. Any English majors in here? Oh, yay, one English major. <laughs> you didn't get to see it. Nobody else raised their hand. <laughs> I was an English major. So. Um, what we know as English majors, that the rest of you guys don't know, is at the bottom of our degree, it says uh, the, the, the holder of this degree gets to write uh, uh, equations out of words. All right? So that's what I'm going to do right here. I'm a professional, trust me. Uh, so I'm going to say those three T's, transparency plus trust plus truth equals values. And do we have any, any math majors in the crowd? We know, hopefully everybody knows, you put something in parentheses, it becomes a multiplier. Right? So we're going to take that word value, and remember the clown who said these prices are insane, uh, we're going to take value and, and make it a much bigger word and more useful to us in the context of food. So to start real quick, with transparency, what you're able to do on a farm like mine is if I say, I show up at farmer's market and I say, uh, hey, look at me, I'm a nice guy. I raise free-range pigs. Um, well, I'm living in a glass house at that point, and I better not be throwing any stones. I, I can't be, okay? So I've got to have transparency uh, in the forefront of my mind as a farmer. And what I can do uh, in, in that vein is if, with our annual farm day, by having, a no, by having no no trespassing sign at the end of my lane, uh, we can put transparency at the height of our values, uh, connect with kids, connect with consumers, find out if our pigs are really raised on pasture, if they're really raised in a barn where they, a door gets open for an hour each day, which is uh, kind of where our, or our organic standards uh, currently allow for, uh, versus uh, New York strips, uh, where the only thing transparent about this food is the actual packaging that's in them, that they're packaged in. A good William Mary guy, John Stewart, right? We get into trust, the second T, real quick. In the past year and a half, we've had this wonderful stuff called pink slime, ammonia soaked centrifuge separated byproduct paste, in case anyone wondered what that is. Everybody remember pink slime? Uh, this stuff was put in our beef. It's a shelf-stable product where you take beef trimmings from tens and tens and tens of thousands of animals, and you put it in a centrifuge and, and saturate it with ammonia, and it becomes this uh, really lean product. And you can then put in fatty beef to technically make it leaner. Uh, 
up till last year, it was in something like 88, 89% of all the ground beef that's out there. It was taken off the market, uh, but it's the food powers that be have decided that it's the word ammonia that people are really scared of. So they've reformulated it and it's being put right back into our ground beef. Uh, if not as we speak, um, it's imminent. That's word from a slate in the Atlantic and all these people that do more investigative journalism than I do because I'm a full-time farmer. In Europe last summer, uh, horse meat, big scandal, right up the street at the Supreme Court, GMO patent law was upheld. Uh, the pen, uh, gave Monsanto the right to uh, penalize farmers for keeping seeds. And in our country, uh, every month we have 30, 33 fruit recalls. That's more than one a day. Okay. Oh, a quick update on the pink slime thing, because I was down in Texas, and remember Rick Perry, right? Uh, uh, a committee of, of governor and lieutenant governor of Nebraska came in and uh, carrying a, a dude at beef shirts. And I love this picture of Rick Perry, because you can't really tell if he's actually eating it or if he's just pressing the sandwich up <laughs> next to his face, going, mmm, 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 really good. So that last one was truth. And uh, again, that was in italics. I'm not going to try and get away with anything. I'm just going to try and translate that into in the word balance. And that's, this is balance in our food system. Okay? This is all about why we value family farms <coughs> and what we can get out of the transparency and the trust. Um, so a couple places where balance is really important. That's out of balance. Okay? Uh, still, even though all the progress we've made, we're still 97% of food. Uh, versus 3% of food organic versus conventionally grown. That's neither here nor there. Um, but to put that in more perspective, every, most folks know that the average bit of food that gets onto our plates, if you are eating at Applebee's or, or shopping at Kroger or whatever, travels 1,500 miles to get there. And you say, well, big deal, forest. Uh, birds fly around, uh, rivers flow, food migrates all over the place. Um, and that's part of our natural tradition. But what's not natural is, is the, is the uh, carbon footprint. Okay. It's not natural for uh, millions of tons of grain to be transported from South Dakota down to a feedlot in Texas. Those animals then tra transported to a slaughterhouse in Illinois, uh, processed, and then sent uh, to Boston in, in one direction, San Diego in the other. We have no natural precedent for that. Even if we get into uh, saying, like, yeah, nutrients migrate around, yes, there's a sustainability in that birds stop and they eat some and, and rivers flow from gravity and photosynthesis kicks in. Nothing so dependent on the huge fossil fuel footprint that we put into it. Come on in. Uh, two, the average age of farmers in the country, anybody? 58, 59 years old. Okay, show me an industry where the average age of somebody that's 58, 59 years old, okay, where everybody's got to eat. This is in the Telegraph, okay? Uh, we're not talking about repairing Model T Fords here. This is, these are people who are growing food that we have to eat, and uh, I'm going to be 40, year, 40 years old this year. My generation of farmers uh, said thanks, but no thanks. They took jobs elsewhere. Okay? And uh, last but not least, in 1980, when I was a kid, the average farmer, if you spent a dollar worth of food, a dollar on food, 30 cents went back to the farmer. According to the USDA right now, we're at about 10 or 11 cents. Okay, these are for the people that are actually you know, producing the food. So what's going on with the balance? This is my son. He's going to be nine years old, and uh, uh, he wants to be a farmer like dad. Hooray. <laughs> right? Which is my job to make, make our farm a desirable place. And this is what I want when I say, please come visit our farm. Uh, when I was growing up, we had a spray house on our farm. We had rusty farm machinery. We had uh, animals raised in confinement, and you, d you couldn't go near any of that stuff. You, were, you would be caught and, you know, uh, administered uh, some, some form of corporal punishment uh, <laughs> to the point where you pick out your own switch, right? It's like Flannery O'Connor up here. Uh, I want a place where kids can just walk around. The worst thing they're going to get is a bee sting, right, or step in some cow manure. Okay. So why do we love family farms? What is it with this nostalgia with farm-to-table restaurants and e even penetration to Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and organic uh, sections of all these restaurants? Um, you go anywhere in the world, I think, and you give people three things. Uh, you give them a job, and you pay them for that job, and the job that they have is more than just about money. It actually helps people. 
okay? It's like actually collaborative, and it helps people. It's a recipe for making people happy. Cue, cue, the, um, cue the I'm happy, right? I'm happy, right? Uh, so I think we value family farms because it gives us a genuine connection to, to the human, human side of our food, okay? And I didn't tell any of these people to smile. Uh, I, I point a camera, and, and they, they, this is the way they look. Uh, they're compensated. They're doing a good job. These are people at farmer's markets where I just, you know, I just hold up the camera, and this is, this is what they look like. Dan Michelson uh, helped me at Arlington up until a few weeks ago. He moved out to California, UVA grad. Uh, really nice guy. Typical, typical hippie-looking guy, right? <laughs> and a typical old man on the other side, right? This is, these, are, these are our stat. These are, this is our per perceived... This is our perceived culture, right? Who are we kidding? Right? It'll never work. Uh, yeah, we got a great 70-year-old man and, and hippie on the other side. That's our 3%, right? So we're told, and I was told all the time, I was actually told not to become a farmer, uh, and then society tried to really tell me by comp, you know, giving me 18 bucks for it. Okay? So we're told... Uh, through our society, through finance, through the economics, a picture of Wall Street, all screaming that it won't work, okay? We're told by big ag that if we, everybody goes organic, uh, the world will starve to death, right? All the time, fear, fear is very powerful. Uh, um, means of communication. Um, and last, last but not least, most hurtful of all, we're told by our blue-haired grannies, no, grandma, no. It'll work, I swear. People want, people want to eat this food. Yeah, but it'll never work. Uh, you know, it's all trendy. It's, organic food is too expensive. It's just trendy. It's a flash in the pan, right? So this is the last 10 years. This is before I started in 1996. Uh, U.S. sales is in green. We've gone from 10, 10 billion in sales to uh, projected this year 35 billion. Okay, this, these numbers had been projected. These numbers came out right, right where it actually was. The blue is annual growth, all right? So from 1990, when I was just first starting to think about farming, that's 500% growth, okay, in 24 years. Those are numbers that would make Warren, Warren Buffett blush, right? Uh, okay, sure, so what's the real story here? Uh, the sales have gone up, but the, the growth has gone down. Anybody know what happened in 2008, 2009? The Great Recession, right? So let me back up just a second. Okay, well, I'll, I'll hang on to that thought a second. I've got a slide in between. So what does $30 billion mean in the real world? Because I'm not, I, I've just been farming for 18 years. I'm not living in the real world, right? Uh, my local tractor supply company is a $10 billion industry. It serves small farms. Whole Foods itself, these are how the companies are valued on, out on, out, out, out on uh, New York Stock Exchange. $20 billion company and John Deere, the, uh, the holy grail of them all, and I own a John Deere tractor. I, I like it, uh, is a $30 billion company. These, these are, nation, these are uh, global companies, all right? So I'm gonna put it side by side. Here's our great recession. This is our economy for the last 10 years. 13 years, uh, where historically we're up around uh, two and a half, three percent. That's like a decent normalized economy. Then we had this huge dip where we were down in the peak at negative five percent for about uh, th right around for three years before we started to bounce back a little bit. And we put these charts side by side. Yes, we see that same dip superimposed over here, but guess what? This is negative five percent. That, that remained above five percent. Okay, so even when the Times were really bad and everybody was suffering. Uh, people still chose to buy the food, this food. Okay, they chose to value this production. Yeah, but. Okay, see the butts are getting shorter? <laughs> Up here, but, but, but. We're starting to stutter now. So that's it as an overall trend. Uh, this is farmer's markets, okay, where we can genuinely connect with the producers uh, right around 1,700 about uh, 20 years ago, and we're up <coughs> to over 8,000 now. But, 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 okay, so farmer's markets. Well, CSA gro growth. When I started out at, uh, as a farmer, I didn't know what a CSA was. I couldn't have told you what CSA was. CSA stands for Community Sup 
supported agriculture, community subscription agriculture, where you buy a share of a farm ahead of time and uh, give the farmer some literal seed money, right? What a concept. Uh, and they've got the finances in February and March to actually you know, kind of capitalize their project. And then as a shareholder, you get a dividend in the form of ever how much vegetables or meat or dairy that the farmer can grow. And sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes you better have some friends. Okay, look at their CSA growth during this time. It's this colossal growth wave. And this is like, these are like, a, a lot of these things are USDA statistics. So anybody that's ever studied government public policy, and I know UVA is well known for that, then you know that that's only part of the story, right? The numbers are much more robust than this. And before we forget, now that we're running out of butts, uh, other opportunities for farmers. Farm to table restaurant, farm to table farms, where pe you know, people actually come to the farm to eat. Uh, urban farming has gone to almost 20,000 urban farms nationwide. We've got opportunities in agritourism. Um, we have buying clubs where people uh, deliver stuff straight in the community. We have expanding wholesale opportunities. Um, practically every supermarket now has an organic section. And, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a picture of Arlington Courthouse Farmer's Market. This is my stand right here. Uh, folks have definitely noticed. So on my side, what do, what do farmers like myself value? You know, now that we've seen that the trends are clearly that the customers are valuing. As a farmer, and these are some of my free range chickens, uh, I have to value authenticity and transparency. I have to, uh, the people, people come to shop with me, it's not because of price, uh, it's because of humane uh, raising of animals, it's because of uh, environmental sustainability, it's because we don't use antibiotics and hormones in our food, it's because, it's because, it's because, okay, it's for a whole spectrum of reasons, and very rarely will any of those reasons be the same, but I, as a farmer, have to be authentic and transparent, not just when the grass is, is nice and green like this, but in, when we've had snows all winter long. Okay? People better get what they're come looking for, they're not gonna shop with me anymore. Uh, sustainability isn't just environmental, it has to be economic on our end. Okay? And what's really sustainable? The most sustainable thing on our farm is, is photosynthesis, rainfall, soil fertility, carbon sequestration, fixing nitrogen in the form of balanced legumes and pasture. Okay, free stuff. That's good for everybody. Getting paid a lifestyle paycheck. Okay, no, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are gonna graduate this spring and go on, but we get back to that thing. Doing a job, getting paid, and doing things for other people, I can't put too fine a point on how intangible the value of that is um, until you've lived it for a while. I don't have a gym membership, okay? <laughs> Making connection, connections with customers, getting to see kids grow up eating this food, and, uh, and have people tell me how much they value our place. And last but not least, for any people that are in here uh, that have ambitions of, of being farmers themselves, uh, the time has already passed my generation by, but it's not too, it's not too late for the very next generation. Uh, I like to feel like I've been out there, and you guys can ride on my coattails a little bit, uh, in, in, in building an understanding of how we value this food and creating a living wage for the next group of farmers. So nobody has to take an $18 a year. So to crib from Shell Silverstein, everybody's seen these places in Virginia, right? There's a Kohl's or a Target right here, or Walmart, okay, and there's a Jersey wall and there's a farm. You don't have to look hard for these places, it's bizarre. Uh, this is where the sidewalk ends and, uh, and the family farm begins. And that's me, as, that's a, I'm a grass farmer. <laughs> All right, so yeah. thank you UVA, and please come visit us at our farm, it's, it's not that far. So that's my presentation. <laughs>